Good morning. Today is the 14th Sunday after the Festival of Pentecost. Uh, the scripture lessons this morning, the Old Testament lesson and the Gospel lesson, uh, speak about people either rejecting Jesus' words or accepting them. In the case of the Old Testament lesson, the Old Testament people said, we will accept the Lord's words and we will follow them. Uh, just so we don't get any wrong impressions, that is certainly not something, a decision that they made on their own. That was something that the Holy Spirit gave them. In the Gospel lesson, uh, we reach the end of Jesus' Bread of Life discourse, and many people turned away from Jesus because it was a difficult uh, teaching that he had taught them. They made that decision on their own. Uh, people reject only because of the hardness of their hearts. Uh, the Epistle lesson, that's our reading from Ephesians, our Lectio Continuo. I believe this is our final one. We will move on to a different lesson next week. The sermon will be based on Ephesians chapter 5. To begin this morning, we will sing hymn number 586. <clears throat> The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Oh, yeah. 
Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise. Make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first lesson is our Old Testament lesson. This morning we read from Joshua chapter 24. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our fathers up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. And the Lord drove up before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. We too will serve the Lord, because he is our God. The words of the Lord. Our psalm for this 14th Sunday after Pentecost is Psalm number 71. It is on page 92 if you're following along in the hymnal. We will sing in unison. <laughs> The second lesson is the epistle lesson. This morning we read from Ephesians chapter 5. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. 
For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. The word of the Lord. They'll now sing together the verse of the day. for the gospel lesson. The gospel lesson for this morning is recorded in John chapter 6. We'll begin reading at verse 60. On hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? What if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? The Spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Yet there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus had known from the beginning which of them did not believe and who would betray him. He went on to say, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless the Father has enabled him. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We'll continue with him 601.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends, God's institution of marriage has never been under attack more than it is today. More people than ever are not staying married while fewer people than ever are even getting married. And even who will be married is up for debate. The sinful world around us has done its best to destroy and to desecrate God's blessed institution of marriage. Therefore, it is good for us to be reminded once again about what the loving God intends for marriage and for husbands and wives who are joined in marriage. It is good for us to hear what God says about marriage through his unerring and authoritative word. God defines his institution of marriage And God defines how husbands and wives will live in his institution of marriage. Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 2. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. A blueprint. A blueprint is a detailed drawing which an architect follows with precision while constructing a building. When God brought Eve to Adam in the Garden of Eden before the fall into sin, he was giving a blueprint to marriage, a blueprint which was to be followed. This first marriage was the blueprint for all marriages to follow. God's blueprint for marriage tells us exactly who will be married. Since God brought Eve to Adam and the two were married, the blueprint to be followed is that one man and one woman are to be married. If we are going to follow God's blueprint for marriage, as it is outlined in God's unerring and authoritative word, and we are going to follow it, then we must reject other worldly sinful arrangements like a man marrying another man, or a woman marrying another woman, or a man being married to multiple women at the same time. This marriage between one man and one woman occurs when the man leaves his father and mother, when a man decides to marry the woman he has chosen. He will make a break from his parents both physically and psychologically and be united to his wife. That Greek word verb translated to be united literally means to be glued together. The man will forge a new and intimate union with his wife And he will make that relationship with his wife the primary of all his other relationships. And how long is this intimate union between one man and one woman to last? Jesus himself defined the God-pleasing duration of a marital union when he said, Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. The Apostle Paul corroborated what Jesus said when he wrote, By law, a married woman is bound to her husband, as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. According to God's blueprint for marriage, as outlined in his unerring and authoritative word, the marriage of one man and one woman is to be a lifelong union. And if we are going to follow God's blueprint for marriage as outlined in his unerring and authoritative word, and we are going to follow it, then we must reject any means that seeks to end a marriage other than death. 
And I'm speaking mainly about divorce. God speaks of his disdain for divorce when he tells his Old Testament people through the prophet Malachi, I hate divorce. Yet he does make an allowance for it in the cases of marital infidelity and malicious desertion. Once one man and one woman have established this lifelong union, they become one flesh. This is, of course, speaking, speaking about the sexual union. God blesses those who have been united in marriage with a sexual union. This gift is given to them so that they have a God-pleasing way to fulfill their innate sex drive for companionship and for the specific purpose of having children. Now, let's look at God's blueprint for marriage once again. Where and only where is the sexual union to occur between a man and a woman? It is only within the bounds of marriage. According to God's blueprint for marriage, as outlined in his unerring and authoritative word, the sexual union is to be enjoyed only by those couples who have been united in marriage. Now, if we are going to follow God's blueprint for marriage, as outlined in his unerring and authoritative word, and we are going to follow it, then we must reject modern sinful practices like living together before marriage, sex before marriage, and sex outside of marriage, for all those are an abuse of God's gift of the sexual union intended only for couples united in marriage. This is God's definition of marriage. One man and one woman will enter a lifelong union in which they will enjoy a sexual union. That is God's definition of marriage. As it is outlined in his unerring and authoritative word, since it is God's unalterable blueprint, human beings have no right at all to change or modify it in any way according to their sinful whims and desires and pleasures. This is God's definition of marriage. And now let us see how God defines the roles of husbands and wives as they live in his institution of marriage. God says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. Paul speaks often about Christ's love for the church. The word love is a very misused and misunderstood word. You can love your dog, pizza, your new home, music. You can love your friends. Sometimes the word love is just another word for physical interaction or an invitation to sexual intercourse. Love is a tricky word to define. But when Paul speaks about Christ's love for the church, he is speaking about love on a higher plane. He is speaking about love of the highest form. He is speaking about the love that the Bible speaks about so often, which is carried out by the true God on behalf of human beings. It is a selfless, self-sacrificing love. It is a love motivated only by grace and not by reward. Christ demonstrated the supreme example of this love for his church when he gave himself up for her to make her holy. Christ showed true love when he literally gave himself up to his enemies 
and then gave up his life on a cross to make his church his own special people by cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and making her without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In true love, Christ purified his church from every stain of sin so that she might be a glorious and radiant church, blameless before the Father in this life and in the life to come. By showing such love and saving his church, Christ became the head of the church, her loving leader. While all those who are connected to Christ by faith are the members, his body. And Christ has become her perfect provider, blessing her with many and varied spiritual and physical gifts. A Christian husband will strive to imitate Christ's selfless and caring love as he carries out his role in marriage. When a husband and wife are united in marriage, they become one flesh. In addition to the sexual union that comes about when a couple are united in marriage, another union occurs. The husband becomes part of the wife, and the wife becomes part of the husband as if they are one. He is incomplete without her. She is incomplete without him. Then in this new God-ordained relationship, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body. <laughs> This role of the head was already assigned to husbands in the order of creation since the man was created first and the woman was created from man and for man. Paul laid out this principle when he wrote in 1 Timothy, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And when he wrote in 1 Corinthians, now I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man. For man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Now even though the husband is the head of his wife, he will never use his headship to be a tyrant or a dictator over his wife. He will never in his role as head be domineering or selfish in his relationship with his wife. Instead, the husband will keep in his, the forefront of his mind always Christ's love for the church as he seeks to carry out his role of head in a husband and wife relationship. He will love his wife with a selfless, self-sacrificing love. He will love and care for his wife as his own body. He will be careful never to hurt or harm his wife with sinful actions or words or attitudes. Moreover, a Christian husband will be sure of his wife's happiness because her happiness is his happiness since they are one. And he will be appreciative of what his wife brings to their relationship, seeking her input and her wisdom as he goes about his role as a head of their household. Christian husbands do, would do well to heed Peter's exhortation. Husbands, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life. Husbands, that is a tall order to fill, isn't it? To love your wife as Christ loved the church, what's a Christian husband to do? A Christian husband will find the way and the will to love his wife in such a way, in God's word and from Christ's example. That is how God defines the role of husbands, Christian husbands in a marriage. Now let's see how God defines the role of Christian wives in marriage. God says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. 
That word submit is used three times in the words I just read for you. That English word has a very negative connotation, doesn't it? Something like this, to yield to the power and authority and control of a mother, of another. You might think of a master and slave relationship, but the Greek verb has no such connotation. It has a much more neutral tone. The Greek verb means to rank people in order under some specific pattern. Like soldiers under a general, for example. The Greek verb implies no kind of lesser value or inferiority as the English word does. When the church sees how Christ loved and still loves her, when the church sees how Christ cares for her and realizes huh, the blessings that come to her through Christ, the church submits herself to Christ. She voluntarily allows Christ to be her head over her. She is more than happy, in view of Christ's love for her, to submit to Christ. Now, as the church submits to Christ, then a voluntary submission being motivated by Christ's love for her. Christian wives will submit to their husbands in everything in response to the love Christ has shown her as part of the church. This will be made easier for a Christian wife to do when she sees and feels her husband loving her with that selfless, self-sacrificing love that Christ showed to the church when she sees her husband caring for her, providing for all of her needs, being concerned for her happiness, and when she realizes all the blessings that come to her through her husband. A Christian wife's submission to her husband is shown simply when she lives in the role God established for her at creation, and that role is simply this, to be her husband's helper, and compliment. A role God intended for all wives is shown by the order of creation once again. That the woman was created for man and from man. In this role, a Christian wife will acknowledge her husband as the head of her and her household. Christian wives that is a tall order to fulfill. To submit to your husband in everything. What is a Christian wife to do? A Christian wife will find the will and the way to submit to her husband in everything in God's word and from the church's example. Indeed, when a Christian husband and wife live together, in their God-ordained roles, with mutual love and respect, it is a noble arrangement, most worthy of comparison between Christ and the church. Husbands, do you feel a little guilty and ashamed like me right now? Would you admit that sometimes we have abused our role as head. Maybe we have been domineering and selfish in our relationship with our wife. Maybe we have bullied or hurt our wife with sinful actions and attitudes and words. Maybe we have been unconcerned about our wife's feelings and needs at times. I think you would say along with me that sometimes we have not loved our wives as Christ loved the church. And Christian wives, do you feel a little guilty and ashamed right now? Have you ever chafed in your role as helper and clamored for equality with your husband? 
Have you ever allowed the sinful world to influence your thinking about the role God has assigned to you? Have you ever complained about your God-appointed role openly or in your heart? I think you would admit that sometimes you have found it very difficult to submit to your husband in everything in love as Christ submits to the church in love. All of us, husbands and wives, are guilty. We have failed to live faithfully in the roles God has assigned to us. We have incurred great guilt before our God, and we deserve his punishment now and forever. Yet we must always remember what Paul has just told us in these words that Christ gave himself up for you and for me to pay for and take away our sin. That Christ has, with his life and death, purified us from every stain of sin and its guilt. And that Christ has made us his own. Through those precious means of grace, the gospel and word and sacrament. So that we are holy and blameless. In the sight of our heavenly father. And so that we can stand before him in that same condition on the final day. To be welcomed into our heavenly home to live in glory forever. God's blessed institution of marriage is under serious attack. May these words of God instill in us a greater appreciation for God's institution of marriage. Whether we are married, have been married, or are still waiting to be married. And may these words of God empower us to live in our God-ordained roles as husbands and wives or husbands and wives yet to be. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will now make a confession of our Christian faith. We will use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the offering.
We will continue with the prayer of the church as it begins on page number seven. You might also follow along in, at page 129 if you're following along in the hymnal. Eternal God and Father, we give you thanks for the blessings we share as members of your holy church, for your gracious word and sacraments, for opportunities to worship and to grow in faith and knowledge, for occasions to serve and be served, for fellowship with believers in our congregation and in our synod. Help us to rejoice in these blessings, dear Lord, and to use them faithfully. Jesus Christ, Lord of the Church, you give grace to your people by calling us to be your witnesses in the world. Open our eyes to see the great and noble mission that lies before us. In the hurting eyes of the lonely, in the pained eyes of the sick, and in the searching eyes of the lost, help us to see your face, O Jesus, and to serve others as we would serve you. Awaken us to the opportunities you give to proclaim your message of love. Holy Spirit, giver of life, through word and sacrament, bestow on us the wisdom and power we need to witness clearly and to act boldly. Help us to speak the truth in love, to give the reason for the hope we have, and to conduct ourselves with gentleness and respect. Set our hearts on fire as we work and witness for Christ. Hear us, Lord, as we pray for a family member, an acquaintance, a neighbor, or a friend who does not believe in you or whose faith is weak or troubled. Bless the church with men and women who are willing to proclaim your word in places where we cannot go. Keep them and their loved ones in your care and let nothing hinder their work. By the power of the gospel, restore their spirits each day so that they do not lose heart as they serve us and others. Move us to support them with our sincere prayers and generous offerings. Wherever your word is proclaimed, O Lord, Grant it success. Let your kingdom come to us and others, so that we and many more might join the assembly of saints and angels to sing your praise forever. Savior of all, hear our prayer, and hear us as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue with him 505.
Please rise for prayer. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive now the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look with favor on you and give you peace. We'll conclude by singing hymn 221, verse 4. be seated. Welcome to all of you this morning. Thank you for being with us. A couple of announcements. Um, my boys express their thanks for your kindness, your well wishes, and your support throughout the year as they pursue their course towards the public ministry, God willing. We thank you too, Laura and I, for your support and your prayers. Um, we feel that very much, and we are so very thankful for that. Everybody got to their destination through much trial and tribulation on the road. Mm. And I was telling somebody this before church, about Saturday afternoon in the car, I said to my wife, you know what? Dexter, Michigan looks really good right about now. <laughs> Just driving through the big cities and such, I don't want that anymore. Dexter looks real good. But thank you to all of you for um, taking good care of our boys. We appreciate it very much. Um, one thing didn't make the bulletin, which should have, um, the installation of the women and faith officers and the Sunday school teachers will take place during the service on Sunday, September 12th. I'm hoping to kick off our Bible classes on the 15th of September and Sunday school to start on the 19th of September. Should have had those things in here, but I forgot, so they'll be in next week. Anybody have anything? Wally does. Yes, uh, after we're, looking for, uh, we're looking for volunteers to help stay in the playground equipment. That's a pretty uh, big investment that we put into that uh, into that unit for our children to enjoy, and we really shouldn't let it go another year without seeing it. So if anybody uh, can donate some time and plan a uh, event to do that project, feel free to contact me or one of our trustees, Steve Zorn, Tom Lester, or Albert Lester. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all. God bless your day.